Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for making the time to join us. We'll get started here in another second or so as people get settled in. I'm very excited to welcome you back to the Science and Practice webinar series, uh, co-hosted by the University of Maine Center for Research on Sustainable Forest, the Forest Stewards Guild, and our latest partner, the Maine Tree Foundation. So many thanks for the help folks in helping us get this organized and off the ground. Just want to remind everyone that this is kind of year three of our seminar series. Um, just like last year, we did a, a joint webinar and field tour. So if there are spots that uh, people want to join, uh, you can follow the link that I post in the, in the website. Uh, we're very excited to have a very distinguished panel with us today and, and uh, I think a great kickoff to the series. Many folks have heard of Route Highland Research Forest. It's been featured both in uh, local and national uh, media and actually has international fame as well. And I think we got many people here to talk about it. Before I got started and turn it over to Amanda, I just want to do our nine acknowledgement statement. I want to respectfully acknowledge that the Wabanaki, the people of the Donland, are the original stewards of the forest we discussed today. The University of Maine is located on Marsh Island on the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. The University of Center for Research on Sustainable Forest supports forest research and education in the homelands of the Penobscot Nation and other Wabanaki tribal nations. We strongly support the inclusion of indigenous science and values in forest stewardship management and research. So a great way to start off this, this series. Uh, hopefully folks can join us on Friday and see this quite unique long-term research site. If you can't, we got other exciting events coming up. So take a look at the website there. With that, I'll turn it over to Amanda to uh, get us started. All right, and I will pass the buck also to Meg um, to launch our first poll to help our speakers get a little sense of the audience. So please take a moment and share, where are you from? Maine, the New England region, outside uh, New England or Canada? Um, also, what background brings you to this meeting? Um, if you can also please share, if you're familiar with Flux Tower Research or the Howland Research Forest, and also, um, we're wondering, what is your understanding of wilderness in the conservation context? And believe it or not, these are actually compatible goals, as you'll hear today. So we'll give folks a little bit of time to fill out that poll. I know people are checking those boxes right now. And uh, while you're checking boxes, public service announcement, we do actually have a few spots left in the field tour this Friday. So if you are interested in uh, getting to climb the fire tower, sorry, the flux tower, um, and getting to uh, getting to see this site in person and meet these folks in person, um, then definitely uh, drop Meg an email, um, you know, or you can uh, register, I think, from the link that uh, Aaron shared in the chat. All right. Uh, responses are coming in. We have about 41% of people that have participated so far. So we'll give you maybe another minute to, uh, to complete that. And in the meantime, get your questions ready and get your listening ears ready to learn about carbon in forest management. All right, it looks like the poll might have accidentally ended. So I'm gonna share the results. <laughs> Sorry about that, Jake, um, sharing the results. So for the folks that had a chance to respond, most of us are coming in from Maine. Um, most of us identify as foresters or scientists or other natural resource professionals. In terms of familiarity with the Flux Tower Research or Howland Research Forest, most people are here to learn all about it. Um, some are familiar with Flux Towers, but not familiar with Howland and only a few are familiar, very familiar, or have done research at the Howland Forest. So last but not least, what is your understanding of wilderness in the conservation context? Um, there's a good, good mixture of responses here. So ecosystems free from human management, about half of you uh, that responded were uh, check that box. Ecosystems um, are under active scientific management for critical habitats and how they sequester and store carbon. Good response. Um, Ecosystems where access is centered on muscle-powered means, so hiking, snowshoeing, no motorized or mechanical recreation, um, also got a strong response. Um, and also partnerships focused on conserving well-managed timberlands and farms. So I see all those. And um, in addition, a few folks check the box for ecosystems that are focused on wildlife preservation. So again, I'm going to stop sharing that now, and we will see 
um, what, we, what our speakers have to share. So now I gotta find our agenda once again. Um, so first up, uh, Dave, if you wanna share your screen and give us a little introduction to Ameriflux and, and what this data and a little bit about the, the Howland Forest. I would be glad to. Uh, can you can you see my screen there? Yep. Okay, fantastic. All right, thanks, Amanda. Uh, and you know, thank you all uh, for the opportunity to highlight some of the work that's been taking place at Howland for for many years. Uh, but before I start, I'd like just to acknowledge uh, others working at me uh, at Howland uh, right now. The top four names as well as some key Howland uh, carbon collaborators from the past. So Howland is a spruce hemlock forest. It's about 25 miles north of Orono. And uh, one of the things that makes it uh, really interesting and unusual, it has unusually old trees for this type of forest in Maine. And we'll hear more about that later. Okay, so Howland uh, is a research forest that's surrounded by working forest. Uh, most of the uh, area in this image, which was uh, taken back in 2002, was owned by International Paper uh, Corporation, and it's now part of the 2.2 um, million acres owned by John Malone. Uh, the Howland Forest, which is, or the current Howland Forest, which is that area outlined by the uh, dashed lines, is. Uh, is presently owned by the Northeast Wilderness Trust. And uh, we're, we're very grateful that they were able to, uh, to purchase it uh, once upon a time, and continue the research. So just a very quick uh, early history of Howland. Uh, Howland was designated for research purposes by international uh, uh, paper as part of a spruce fir co-op that uh, they formed a government sort of industry partnership back in the 1980s. And it was driven in part um, by the spruce budworm uh, sort of outbreak before that. Uh, but I think at, at the time by the, the problem of red spruce decline, which was uh, widely believed to be due to acid rain. So the site was established, then the infrastructure uh, with funds from the uh, EPA and the Forest Service in 1986, and a research tower was installed there in 1987, and that's when meteorological monitoring be, uh, began. And I think Howland is a, is a great testament to the idea of, you know, if you build it, uh, they'll come, uh, because in no time, NASA discovered that there was a, a tower and all sorts of interesting um, data coming out of it. And they began what they called the Forest Ecosystem Dynamics Program in the late 80s, where they were running pretty much every sort of sensor that they had, LIDAR, radar, all sorts of um, you know, precision optical sensors at the time. And I think in the, in the late 80s or early 90s, I understand Holland was the most photographed uh, spot on Earth from space. Uh, in 1990, the Clean Air Act was amended, and that started the decline of, of acid and, and nitrogen in, in rainfall, and research evolved in, in, in different directions. And then in 1995, um, carbon flux studied, uh, studies began at Howland, and, and that's when I sort of appeared on the scene. Uh, and then uh, just fast forward a few more years, in, uh, I think it was about 1999, the uh, landowners decided that they would resume harvesting in the forest and that it would no longer be a research forest. And to those of us that were working there at the time, uh, we were very pleased that the Northeast Wilderness Trust um, put together a program and purchased the land from the owners at the time and designated it forever wild. So, I've mentioned sort of these uh, these these flux towers. We've heard about them a few times, uh, and I will say a special feature at Howland is the presence of carbon flux towers. Uh, you can see one in the in the lower right of of this picture, and basically these towers have equipment on top of them, which allow us to continuously measure the carbon going into and out of the forest. Really, with this equipment, we can see the forest breathing on a second by second basis 
And this has been going on now for, for over 27 years. So we have a very long and precise record of, of what's been happening in terms of the carbon into and, and out of the forest over this time. Uh, Howland is just one of many sites, over 400 in fact, uh, that are part of a network of sites that make these sorts of carbon flux measurements. But Howland was one of the very first sites in the country to do this. And it now has the, uh, the second longest record of, of all of the sites. They, there's a, a similar tower down at the Harvard Forest in Massachusetts, and they, they have the record. And I don't know how we'll, how we'll ever catch them, but we're, we're just a year or so behind them. And just to finish up, um, a, a key finding from Howland right now is that the Howland Forest, this, this sort of what would be considered commercially an overmature uh, spruce hemlock forest, is a carbon storage powerhouse. It's been uh, taking up and storing carbon from the atmosphere, kind of an average of over two metric tons of carbon per hectare per year. And this uptake has continued despite the 25 years or so that we've been making these measurements. The, the Howland area has experienced the hottest year in the 120 degree record, the wettest year in that same time frame, and also the second uh, driest. And in spite of all of that, the uptake has continued. And what's even more remarkable is the carbon uptake in this forest has actually been increasing by about 1% per year um, since we began began the measurements back in 1996. So um, really exciting result shows that forests in Maine are really, really doing their thing. So I'll, I'll finish there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that quick overview. Um, so we'll turn next to John, who's going to share a little bit about the conservation role um, and kind of pick up the story of the Howland Forest uh, where he left off. So John, you're able to share your screen. There we go. All right. Well, thank you. Um, my name is John Leibowitz. I'm the executive director of Northeast Wilderness Trust. Uh, also somewhere in, in the Zoom world here is Hannah Epstein, who's our stewardship manager, uh, and she'll be on the site visit in a couple of days for anyone that's attending that. Um, so Northeast Wilderness Trust, very briefly, is the only regional land trust in the Northeast that focuses exclusively on rewilding and wilderness conservation. We work all across New England and uh, upstate New York, the Adirondack region. We are in our 20th year and we now safeguard 70,000 acres of wilderness across the region. Um, and through our passive management style, which is apparent at Howland, uh, we like to say that all of the lands we protect today are the ancient forests of tomorrow. They're all gonna grow old. Let me see how to... There we go. All right. So um, as David just said, we purchased Howland in 2007. It was uh, at risk of being harvested and we were able to, to jump in and, and purchase it, which was a wonderful success story. Uh, the 550 acre property, it's of course known for the research that David was just talking about. What is less known about it is that it is protected as forever wild. And Howland itself is a special forest. Um, we, we often say that some trees on that property uh, are so old that they were standing where they are today, soaking up carbon and providing shelter for wildlife when Henry David Thoreau passed through this area on his way to Katahdin over 150 years ago. Beyond simply holding the title, Northeast Wilderness Trust ensures that the land remains forever wild with a legal instrument that we call a declaration of trust, which is similar to a conservation easement in that it's recorded uh, and it will run with the deed forever. And essentially what it does is prohibits extraction. Um, and while the forest is already quite old, uh, the forever wild protections mean that it will remain wild in perpetuity. Uh, when trees fall at Howland Forest, they stay where they lie and they add complexity and richness to the forest. So I want to just put into context what wilderness conservation means in the Northeast. Uh, protecting lands as wild is a complementary strategy to the continued conservation of well-managed woodlands. Um, Northeast Wilderness Trust is a partner of Wildlands and Woodlands Initiative. And while we as an organization focus exclusively on wildlands, 
we support a holistic approach to conservation, which includes wildlands, woodlands, farmlands, and community involvement. So we like to really emphasize that it's important to say wildlands and woodlands, not wildlands or woodlands. Uh, and context is important. So this is a map that shows all the Northeast and all of the light green is conserved land. Uh, the data is a little out of date at this point, but the, the point to get across is that about 25% of New England is conserved in some way through private and public means. The same data is shown here, pulling back a layer of all the wildlands in New England. So you can see there's much less light green and approximately three and a half percent of our region is protected as forever wild today. So our mission and why we work at Howland and other similar forests is to increase this number. Uh, and by doing so, protecting wild forests for wildlife, people, carbon storage, uh, and in the case of Howland, a place to conduct critical research. Uh, all right, and then very briefly, I got two slides left. Um, I want to just talk about what, what do we mean by wilderness or forever wild? Wilderness is land that is essentially left to its own will. In the Wilderness Act of 1964, the word untrammeled is used, and the roots of the word wilderness, as described and researched by Jay Vest, you can see a little picture of his research paper, uh, it means will of the land, self-willed forest. And freedom is essentially the philosophical underpinning of wilderness and our work. So in a self-willed landscape like Howland, trees grow old and die on their own time frame. species form multiple generations, complexity increases, niche habitats are naturally created, and coarse woody debris dominates the landscape, which is an element that's often missing from managed landscapes. And so all of this biomass complexity, it increases year after year, and that's what's been happening at Howland for many, many years and will continue happening there. So then finally, I just want to conclude my brief presentation uh, talking about the importance of the research that's coming out of Howland and how it has informed our work at Northeast Wilderness Trust. Uh, we've released two papers specifically on carbon. Uh, we title them Wild Carbon. Um, and we've utilized the research that's come out of Howland very directly. So these papers discuss the utility of old and wild forests, what some might call overmature, as David pointed out. Uh, and when it comes to carbon storage and carbon sequestration, what does that mean? So specifically through these papers, which are available to download for anyone here today, um, we sought to address common misunderstandings around how much carbon is stored in old forests and specifically the outsized role of big individual old trees. And in our follow-up report, we sought to address the ongoing debate about sequestration rate of carbon in old and wild forests, essentially how much carbon is being added annually to that stored uh, amount. And our conclusion uh, is that old forests often sequester as much carbon and sometimes more than younger forests when taking all of the fluxes into account. And that's research that has come out of Howland, among other places. So again, both of these reports are available for you to download. And if you're interested in carbon flux uh, research from Newt's perspective and how we've kind of packaged it with the rest of our work, you can download those. So I'll just finish with a lovely quote. Whoop, and I just skipped it. Hold on. Well, it's gone now, but I'll sh I can share it another time. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's all I've got. Thank you, John. I know there's a lot more to tell in that story. Um, if you have a moment, you can also copy and paste that quote into the chat. It looked like it was an Albert Einstein quote. So I will do that. All right. Thank you. Sean is up next. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, everyone. Can you folks see a photograph, a picture? Yeah, well, it's exciting. Yeah, this is exciting. It's really a striking photograph of the tower itself and the surrounding landscape and I was afraid either Dave or John would show this before I did, but I'm glad, I'm glad they didn't. All right, so I'm going to, I have a few slides here about the, the plot network and the tower locations. So as Dave pointed out, we have several towers, the West Tower, the Main Tower, and the East Tower. Around each one of those towers, we have a network of um, what we call continuous forest inventory or CFI plots, and those are shown as these yellow dots that form a concentric ring around each tower. 
So each tower has 48 of these plots, three towers and then a few other plots at the North Tower. So we have about 150 of these long-term research plots. In addition to that, you notice this red cross hatched area here. This is what we refer to as the NASA plot. So the NASA plot, as Dave indicated, was established when NASA first started working here in the late 80s. This plot was established in uh, 1989 for the purpose of ground truthing some of NASA's op optical instruments, the remote sensing instruments. This is, a, the, by US standards, this is an enormous plot. It's three hectares or about 7.4 acres. Within that plot, all the trees above 10 centimeters are mapped and measured. And you can see the image here to the right. Um, those circles, of course, indicate the location of trees. The circles are scaled according to their tree diameter. So it's a, a just a wonderful data set to work with. So back in 2015, one of my grad students, Aaron Teets, shown here on the right, he and I and some others cored about 10% of these trees on the NASA plot to look at growth trends and climate growth relationships. And I should add there, I think it's here, there are about 3,000 trees on this plot. And again, everyone mapped and measured. So Dave and John both referred to the age structure of the Howland Forest. Here it is in some more detail. And again, this is in information from those cores that we collected on the NASA plot. So on a horizontal axis, we have the decades in which the trees were recruited. That is the decade in which they reached breast height where we cored them. And if you look at this, you see most of the trees were recruited in the 1920s. Right, and we think this was following a spruce budworm outbreak. But there's also sporadic recruitment here in the late 1800s, probably from uh, some selective harvesting of large white pines. So I don't know if you folks have noticed this, but the most striking thing about this age distribution is this large old yellow birch that's now 363 years old, right? The innermost ring from the core we took from that tree was 1659. So I have a colleague at Harvard Forest that keeps track of the oldest trees in New England, and this is the state record yellow birch for Maine. The striking thing about it, it just happened to be on our plot. We didn't go looking for this tree. It just happened to be there. Yeah, so one benefit of having these really detailed records, um, I warn my students not to show complicated tables like this, but I'll go through it a few. So each row is a species. Again, in 1989 on that NASA plot, we had 1,522 trees. We re-inventoried that plot in 2015. 291 of those original 1522 had died. So 19% mortality, if we express that on an annual basis, it's uh, less than 1%, about 0.73. If you look at the entire mortality rate of 0.64 on an annual basis. That's a bit, quite a bit lower than our, what we assume to be the 1% typical mortality rate for um, trees in New England and unmanaged forests. So again, just showing the benefit of having these detailed long-term studies. Um, another grad student of mine, Aaron Fiend, did some uh, detailed work uh, looking at growth and mortality or probability of survival. So if you look at this upper graph on the vertical axis, it's a log transformation, but think of it as just growth as a function of crowding, that is crowding around individual trees. And you see that as crowding increases, as the trees are under more competitive stress, the growth, growth rate decreases. The same with the probability of survival. As crowding increases, the survival rate decreases. This is absolutely no surprise to forest managers. This is the justification for uh, silvicultural thinning and selecting crop trees and so forth. The reason I show it here is, again, this large detailed robust data set just demonstrates that inequivocally, and it shows that those 
species are behaving in a real similar manner. Yeah, I did have a more detailed image of this. I tried to simplify it. So this is Aaron Teet's work. And here we converted the ring width from those cores we collected into biomass increments. And you can just see the enormous variability in uh, this is stand level biomass increment um, over the years. And as it turns out, our, from our work, we determined that, that uh, stand level growth increases with greater summer precipitation and also with warmer springs. Presumably the warmer springs give the trees the stand at an early start on growth. And this is my final slide, just to make, um, make the point that I currently have one grad student working up at Howland. This is Zoe Reed, one of my master's students. And here we're looking at, we're asking the question, how much CO2 is released from decaying logs? So once a log dies, it's colonized by wood decay fungi. The wood decay fungi respire. In doing so, they give off CO2. And that CO2 that was stored in the log is slowly released into the atmosphere. So we're trying to quantify um, the rate at which that takes place. And that's my final slide. And again, I wanna thank the Northeast Wilderness Trust for preserving the site and making all this fun work possible. 3,000 trees, seven acres, fun work, yes. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Sean. So last but not least, uh, Kathleen is going to turn the page over and talk a little bit about methane flux. Hi. OK. Um, I am just wanted to introduce myself. Sorry if I look to the side. Just give me one second. Um, so my name is Kathleen Savage. I am a senior research associate at the Woodville Climate Research Center. Um, I have been working at Howland Forest, not quite as long as Dave, um, since 1998. Uh, and my main focus there has been actually looking at uh, trace gas fluxes, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And uh, even though I don't go up there that often in the winter time, that's my favorite picture of Howland Forest, <laughs> of the one of the instrument shacks in the winter. And why is that not turning? Oops, sorry. Um, so uh, as Dave mentioned, uh, the Eddy Covariance Tower has been measuring the net exchange of carbon dioxide uh, since approximately 1996, this long-term record. But another important carbon um, source and sink or uh, flux through the forest is actually methane. Um, and the main tower has been measuring methane since 19, uh, since 2012, um, and which is actually a fairly long-term record for eddy covariance and methane. Um, development of sensors to measure methane lag behind the development of, of CO2 sensors, um, and so methane has become this. There's become this real interest in methane um, because. Um, because it is an important greenhouse gas and it is a, a part of the budget, the carbon budget that has not been as um, studied um, among forests and forest systems uh, as carbon dioxide, which has been the main one. And uh, the research that Dave has um, been conducting in the um, net ecosystem that ecosystem exchange of um, methane has shown that Howland Research Forest is actually a sink of methane, meaning it is actually taking up more methane than it is producing. Um, and this is actually really unusual. Um, most of the uh, tower sites or the places that um, people locate towers are sources of methane, meaning they're giving off more methane into the atmosphere than they're actually taking up. And this makes Howland um, Research Forest um, a really unique forest for that. Um, so recently, um, Dave Hollinger, Sean Fravor, and colleagues at Emory University in um, Georgia, Arizona State, and San Diego State um, we came together and wrote a proposal to try and um, fill the knowledge gap of the methane moving through the um, forest at Howland Forest. Um, and we asked the question, um, you know, right now Howland Forest is a net sink of methane. In the Northeast under future climate changes, 
um, the northeast areas is projected to get warmer and wetter. And our, our overall question is, will this forest transition over time under future climate change from a net methane sink to becoming a net methane source to the atmosphere? Um, so just a little background on methane. Methane is actually produced under anaerobic, very wet um, conditions. You often get it out of wetlands, uh, rice paddies, um, and it's consumed under aerobic conditions, conditions in which you have oxygen, drier conditions. Um, so our collaborative effort that we're starting up actually in a few days, November 1st is the official start of the project. Um, we are gonna actually look at methane, methane production, um, and methane oxidation or methane consumption from um, soil, below ground soil microbial processes. Um, and you can see a nice picture of Holly, a former um, person who worked out at Howland, um, through to um, fluxes of methane from both um, the soil surfaces. Um, you can see that on the left, uh, the left picture. But also something that um, we're uh, very interested in looking at is methane fluxes from downed and dead wood and also from tree fluxes. And some preliminary data from the site shows that um, uh, there are methane fluxes. There are positive fluxes of methane coming out of trees, tree stems and down logs. We um, intend to do a much broader survey of that to look at um, the forest as a whole and to ask questions um, like, you know, where is this uh, flux? Where is the flux coming from? Is methane being transported through the tree and from the soils and out, or are there microbes living on the surfaces of the leaves or on the surfaces of the um, stems that are producing or oxidizing methane? And these are real knowledge gaps, not just at Howland Forest, but in a lot of it, uh, a lot of research um, going on. And so we are gonna focus on that and because one of the questions that we're asking is, or the main question that we're asking is, um, under wetting, under um, future climate conditions of warmer and wetter, will this um, site, will the Howland Forest transition from a net sink to source? And we are intending to do um, a little uh, wet up experiment where we're going to take a small um, areas and we're actually going to add some additional moisture to it to see how that changes to the flux to look at the, the drivers of that sourcing transition of methane flux. And this is a really interesting upcoming project and then it will all be tied together with the um, methane fluxes seen by the Eddy Covariance Tower across the region. Um, and it's, it's gonna be a, a very interesting um, knowledge, new knowledge of methane and how methane fluxes. And just so in case you think we forgot carbon dioxide, we will be doing carbon dioxide at the same time. I'm just presenting methane. Um, and that's my my talk. Wow, thank you. Ah, oh, so um, Meg, if you'd be able to spotlight all of our speakers, that would be great. Um, thank you all so much for those uh, very succinct uh, and um, and very well uh, presented uh, uh, yeah, presentations on each of your topics within the broader story of the Howland Forest. Um, and listening to everyone, um, everyone, I was I was struck by the kind of a couple of aspects. There's scale. So going from the, you know, like the microscopic or sub the molecular level of, you know, carbon and you know, carbon dioxide and how atoms work together and how that ties to climate and climate change and uh, and tree physiology and interactions um, within the Howland Forest. But also, as John presented, looking at the balance of this as a wilderness area with a really, really important story to tell through the scientific work that's being done at this forest and what that means to the broader picture of the work that you know, the Northeast Wilderness Trust does across the whole Northeast region. Um, so wilderness, as, as you said, John, is a piece of the broader picture. Um, and it's really exciting that we've got this chance to tie science and conservation so closely um, at, this, at this site. Um, so um, we had a couple of questions that came in, and I want to remind uh, remind our speakers that the audience is largely forest managers, uh, largely from Maine. Um, so we do have a couple of management questions, and I'm going to get to those before I get to Carl's question. I see that there too. So a couple of management questions. Um, let's see. So uh, the first, Jake asked, how do you deal with invasive species in forever wild areas? And a related one that Jim asked, what's your policy on forest fires? So would a fire be allowed to burn through or would you attempt to control it? 
Two, two great questions. So we have a couple, we obviously have opinions on these, on these topics. Um, so the first one, invasive species, I, I can, what I can say is we take a hands-off approach to management as an organization. We are not um, claiming that a hands-off approach is the appropriate management scheme for the entire landscape. But we do think that it's really important for there to be some places across New England and the Northeast where land is left to its own devices. And what that means on Northeast Wilderness Trust lands, we don't do anything about invasive species. Um, and you know, in the case of, let's say, emerald ash borer, we know that some of our forest composition are going to change dramatically in the coming years. And that's going to create a huge influx of coarse woody debris in those forests. And we will uh grieve the loss of ash trees but it's also just how it's going to happen on these wild places um we've also just to note that anecdotally and we don't have any you know longitudinal studies on this yet but it's something we're thinking about doing as an organization there's a there's some relationship between a wild forest and a lack of disturbance and a lack of invasive species. So what we have found in our closed canopy forests that haven't had any disturbance in many years, there just isn't a lot of invasives yet. That may change as the climate changes and what's happening in Southern New England creeps into Northern New England. But even so, we're planning on, on taking a hands-off approach and studying it and observing it while having that position. Um, I'll take a, just a quick stab at the fire thing, and then I don't want to dominate the Q&A session here. Um, our, our policy is very similar. If a fire swept through one of our properties, we essentially wouldn't do anything. Now, there's an enormous asterisk to that, which is most of our lands are in close proximity to towns, other private properties, etc. cetera. Um, if a fire breaks out on one of our properties, generally speaking, the local fire department would put it out. And that has happened on a number of our preserves, totally consistent with our forever wild legal mechanisms. We would never pre prevent uh, a municipality from putting out a fire because of human safety. Uh, but at a larger scale, we would not, ecologically speaking, be worried about a, wire, uh, a fire coming through any of our properties. Great, thank you so much for those responses, John. So uh, Carl is asking, uh, can someone please explain how the towers work to measure carbon fluxes? I don't know if Dave or Kathleen want to tackle that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll <clears throat> excuse me, I'll, I'll take a go, uh, Carl. Um, I think the best way to think of it is that, so you have these towers above the forest and at the, the, the height of the instrumentation on the tower, you kind of imagine this sort of invisible plane that's that's out there across the forest, above the forest. And the equipment there does does two things. It measures the the wind, kind of the, the wind speed, because the wind doesn't just blow horizontally. There's always a little bit of an up and down component to it. It blows down, it blows up. So the instruments record how much the air is blowing down across that plane. And at the same time, they record how much CO2 or methane, whatever it is that you're interested, is in that little kind of parcel of air that's that's moving across that plane. And they, of course, also uh, monitor the amount of CO2 or whatever it is in those parcels that are basically moving up and out of the forest. And you basically add up, you know, the little bits that are coming in and you subtract out the bits that are going out and you're you're making these measurements continuously, maybe five times a second. And when you kind of add it all up and you do the math or whatever it is and the, the program does it for you, it'll it'll give you a nice average um, flux across an area that's um, several acres uh, in size. Thanks for that. Um, I don't know if any of the other speakers. Yeah, want if that's to... clear enough, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Um, and Carl, I think you should come on the field tour so you can uh, climb the tower and see for yourself. That's probably the, the best way to get get a sense of it. Um, That's right. You can feel the breeze up there then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, Jay has a question. Uh, this is going to be a good one, I'm sure. 
So um, on this carbon thread, so Jay says, interesting to see how the forest is continuing to store more carbon as it ages. Can someone speak to how we can apply some of these lessons from an unmanaged forest to a managed forest where we may want to achieve some amount of carbon storage and timber harvesting? Um, I can maybe maybe take a um, take another stab at that. Um, you know, I think we were surprised, honestly, to see that the forest was storing so much carbon. Uh, this this mature forest, um, and a lot of the kind of the modeling and even the the dogma, if you will, in in, e in ecology, is that as a forest ages, it it may eventually even reach some sort of steady state in in carbon. That that's kind of old old ideas from back in the 60s, but nobody ever knew because nobody had kind of made these measurements. So we were pretty surprised to see that not only is, you know, do these forests continue storing at a good, at a good robust rate, and even more surprised to see that that was um, increasing. We're still not 100% sure why that increase is there. We know it's real. Uh, I think it has to do maybe with, with as uh, Kathleen uh, or maybe was Sean mentioned the uh, the warmer spring times. The forest loves loves those early starts. It's evergreen, so as soon as things thaw, it's it's up and going, uh, and it it does like those sort of uh, wetter summers, and it is getting wetter up in central Maine as as well. Uh, but another another factor which is hard to disentangle is that you know worldwide the amount of carbon dioxide is is going up in the atmosphere at a pretty good clip. And, you know, there are a lot of bad things about CO2 in terms of, you know, holding in the heat and causing warming. Uh, but to a certain extent, it does act as a sort of a, a fertilizer for photosynthesis. So, so this increase may also be, be partially a, a response to that. And, and I think some of, the, um, some of the early models didn't include all of these, these kinds of factors. Thanks for that. Sean, I saw you unmuted as well. Did you want to uh, add on to Dave's response? No, I, I don't think I can improve on what Dave said. <laughs> all right, thanks. Um, Nancy had a quick clarifying question. So are all the measurements we're discussing in relation to above ground fluxes and sinks, not in relation to soil carbon? I can. Um, yeah, I guess we, we kind of focused on that, but no. Um, Soils actually, um, in a lot of cases, for carbon dioxide um, the, through decomposition and um, respiration from roots and um, it, within the soil system, release CO2 from below ground. They decompose um, soil organic matter and release CO2. Methane is a little bit different um, depending on where you are. So if you're in a wetland, an anaerobic environment, you generally get a production of methane, a release of methane. Um, from the soils. Um, the picture I showed you was um, of, a, of a wetland area where you would see that. If you're in an aerobic environment, like the upland soils um, closer to where the tower is, you have oxygen and under um, aerobic environments, methane is actually oxidized um, by microbes in the, in the soils. And so that is an actual sink uh, of methane. And so the soils, soils for methane can be a source or sink Soils for carbon dioxide are a source of carbon dioxide. The, the above ground then is, uh, you know, above ground trees can also be sources and sinks for um, carbon dioxide, depending on photosynthesis and respiration processes. Um, so yes, the, the soils play a big part in it too. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, you're measuring an awful lot of stuff at the Howland Forest, but it's maybe impossible to measure everything. Um, a related question that came in uh, for any of you is, how does the mortality of old trees affect carbon storage and release? So maybe I'll tackle that and others can chime in. So while the tree's living, a healthy tree, it photosynthesizes, right? It brings in carbon um, via CO2, it brings in carbon from the atmosphere and stores it. When the tree dies, um, that stored carbon is slowly released to the atmosphere as a result of the respiration of wood decay fungi, the metabolism, the work of wood decay fungi. So a tree that stores a large, or a, a large tree, once it dies, of course it contains a lot of carbon, but that large amount is slowly released over the decades. And that was, um, I showed a slide of 
So we read measuring the CO2 flux from actually smaller dead trees, uh, but we're hoping to scale that up to, to uh, sort of a landscape level estimate of CO2 flux. So I don't know if that answered your question, but dead trees release that carbon slowly over time. And maybe on a related note, uh, Jake asks, old growth forests are said to be carbon neutral. Does that mean that the Howland forest uh, is, is just not old growth yet? Or does it challenge the view that old growth forests do not sequester carbon? I, I would go, I would lead on the other half. I, I think um, Howland is not old, old growth. I mean, um, the hemlock and I think the oldest hemlocks can be, I don't know, eight, five, six, seven, eight hundred years old. So uh, it's it's nowhere near that yet, but um, the trees are still putting on wood. The uh, soil is still increasing in carbon, so um, there's a lot of places that it's it's still going right now. I I'll I'll add I'm, this is out of my expertise. I'm not a scientist, uh, but but I will add that the research that we've been collecting at Northeast Wilderness Trust does certainly indicate that perhaps. Um, there is more evidence out there that's challenging the longstanding uh, belief that old growth forests are by default carbon neutral or oftentimes thought of as carbon sources. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of research that's coming out that's challenging those long held beliefs or understandings. Um, and we, we do cite a lot of those studies in those wild carbon reports that I uh, shared with the audience here today, or will be available to the audience. I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah, we'll share the links. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, both of you for your responses there. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, you know, old growth. You know, uh, Aaron started with a land acknowledgement statement, and then we had uh, a couple of presentations, uh, kind of picking up the history of Howland Forest from the 1980s to the present, which is not terribly long in the history of time immemorial. Um, so it is a good reminder, um, you know, Dave, thanks for reminding us about, you know, how old hemlocks can get, for instance. Um, so, you know, old growth, we aren't very, most of us don't get to see it very much uh, as we look around the state of Maine and other places. Um, we would love to see more of it on the landscape for lots and lots of reasons, including uh, carbon uh, storage capabilities, um, but, and obviously for other goals as well. So thinking about what we, what we can learn from Howland in the context of uh, how that might apply to broader places, whether they are managed forests or unmanaged. Um, there's lot, lots of good questions out there. Um, let's see. So we had another response from Carl. Uh, Carl had said, uh, thanks, Dave. I'll climb the tower on Friday. And he's also wondering, how does the tower software distinguish carbon from trees within the 500 acres versus carbon that may have drifted in from beyond the boundary? Yeah, I, I sort of gave an answer back because it it is this it it I, the answer is it depends and it actually depends upon the wind speed and and everything else. Sort of the faster the wind blows, the kind of the further away the the tower can kind of see what's happening. But but on average, it it sees most of what's happening within you know certainly within uh, you know a, a few thousand feet of the tower, which is which is which is within the boundaries. <laughs> Great, thank you. And on a possibly related question, Ernest is wondering, could this research possibly be used to predict the impact of the establishment of a commercial wind farm on carbon storage and sequestration? Food for thought. Maybe, I mean, one, one thing that is useful from these towers and, and, and it is, it's kind of fun having this because a lot of other people kind of are always happy to, to jump on board and put their equipment up there as well, uh, is, is we have really good detailed uh, meteorological information about, you know, wind speeds and the gustiness and all these sorts of things. And that is the kind of information that, um, that wind farms would really, really find valuable. Yeah, it's fascinating that we're getting uh, some very detailed questions that are very site specific, but at the same time, you know, just remembering the broader context. And I think about, uh, you know, the map of um, of the Ameriflux uh, tower network and just how, you know, how broad that is and all the data that's been collected in recent decades and the story, uh, the stories that can be told by those data. Um, so it's it's really fascinating. Um, another related question uh, on that theme, what are some of the connections between climate change trends in Maine and carbon and methane flux as observed at Howland. 
So some of you touched on the connection between climate uh, climate change trends in Maine and uh, what what's being observed at Howland a little bit. But if anyone's willing to elaborate on that, it'd be great. Sean, you want to take a shot, and then maybe you, Kathleen. I think we all could. <laughs> Um, sorry to bail, but I've actually got to run. I put that in the chat. I'm teaching a class in a few minutes, so <laughs> it's, the burden's on uh, Kathleen and Dave. Sorry about this. Thank you so much for joining us, Sean. Have a good class. Keep keep training more people. <laughs> um, I, you know, I have a little tough time on the overall trends in all of Maine. Um, the fact that Howland is a net sink. Um, you know, they're just looking at the geography of the rest of Maine, there's a lot of wetland areas that if we had situated the tower somewhere else, it may have been a net source. Um, there's really been no scaling up because there's just no, there's not really been the data to do that. Um, but what we have seen at specifically at Howland, um, I've been doing soil fluxes there and, and Dave's seen this in the tower. When you get a really wet year or spring or period, I've seen some of my drier locations that are net sinks transition to net sources for very short periods of time. Um, so the potential in the future um, under a wetter conditions, um, if, if, if we assume, if we make up a huge assumption that Howland is representative of all of Maine, um, we might be able to say, well, in the future, if we see um, Howland switch from, from a transition from a sink to a source, the rest of Maine may suddenly become a new source of, of carbon to the atmosphere. Um, that's a big if. So, um, <laughs> but part of the reason we're doing this work is to get the data we need to sort of make some of those predictions in the future, and that is part of that um, new grant. Yeah, and I and I should add that what Kathleen was talking about is is methane that it may become a source of methane. Um, you know, Maine has been warming. It's been getting a bit wetter. Uh, the warming is especially, I think everybody knows in the wintertime, uh, not, winters are not what they used to be. Um, but in general, um, forests, um, you know, plants like warmer and wetter conditions. And, and certainly uh, there's, there doesn't seem to be any, you know, short-term danger uh, for, the, for the forests of Maine, I think with the kind of, you know, warming and the changes that we've seen. Uh, but you know, there's always this risk, and I think that ought to be, a, you know, a really strong motivator for all of us to, you know, do what we can to, um, you know, to turn to turn climate change around. You know, to you know reduce fossil fuels. Oh, I mean, I'll I'll get on my soapbox here, but we know what we need to do, and the better we are at, at you know, stopping climate change, the the less we have to worry about the impacts of it. Yeah, I'll, uh, just to add a tiny nugget to that, um, one of the values of forever wild conservation and wilderness that I did not speak to, but it, can, it relates to this answer, is places like Howland are critical for research in that they act as the control for what the rest of the landscape is going through. So when we're managing other lands uh, or measuring carbon or methane on other lands, that are managed, it's really important to have places like Howland out there that are just going as things uh, may be without much influence. So the control for the larger um, landscape is another just important kind of contextual piece on why wildlands are important. Yeah, thank you for that, John. And uh, I think we had another question earlier, um, kind of tied to that. Um, so Jake asked, uh, does it mean that three and a half percent of the Northeast or New England will be hands off? So I guess tying to that, you know, control and the landscape context. Um, yeah, how how much of the Northeast might be sort of uh, part of this hands off approach? And uh, what and again, kind of the context of science and control and applied science, what does that look like to you? So uh, of that three and a half percent, and I think I think the actual number is three point four. I just rounded for my presentation. Um, that includes a lot of different types of land. So that includes, for instance, federal lands that are wilderness with a capital W, congressionally designated wild places. That includes lands that are owned by states. Um, as public land, it also includes privately conserved lands like uh, lands that Northeast Wilderness Trust owns. And then, of course, it includes privately owned land that 
individuals donate a forever wild easement to whatever land trust it may be. So the, the central theme on what counts, if you will, as a wild land or a wilderness or a forever wild landscape is a hands-off approach to management. So I think to answer your question, I went a little roundabout there, but to answer your question, I would say that that's probably an accurate assumption that about three and a half percent of New England um, is formally designated in some fashion through many different legal mechanisms that there is a hands-off approach on about that much land in our region. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm actually gonna call on Aaron as our host. Um, you mentioned uh, Aaron in the chat a little bit about the carbon budget um, and maybe this will help tie things uh, together with what's happening at the How at Howland. Um, so Aaron, could you elaborate a little bit about the, the carbon budget and why you shared that resource in the chat? Yeah, I think it's important as we <clears throat> talk about budgets and the diverse ecosystems that uh, and kind of cover Maine. Obviously, Maine is mostly forested, <clears throat> so that's a big part of our budget. Uh, what I did put in the chat is our actual detailed budget. This is the first time that that Maine went through an actual inventory. I'll quickly share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, this is a two pager that we put out. I've even had their governor, uh, Governor Mills, cite this number as well. But we try to account for all the buckets that um, happen in Maine, as we as we know, carbon's emitted and carbon stored. Uh, so that's kind of this left hand is all the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we did this at two points in time, 2006 and 2016. Uh, this is called a stock change, so that we estimated the stocks at these uh, levels and then we compared them. So these are our emissions, and then basically these are the ecosystems within Maine, including the forest, wetlands, agriculture, urban, and then our kind of inland and coastal waterways. Uh, you can see whether they're kind of a net uptake or a net emission, like uh, agriculture has a small net emission, whereas forests obviously are sequestering carbon. The difficult part is when you get to products and where this, where the wood after it's harvested goes. Uh, we can see there's quite a bit of a transfer from the forest to the wood harvested pool. And as we mentioned, there's some decay and uh, um, uh, release back to the atmosphere through the processing. Overall, though, we're looking at about 75% storage um, from the forest. So 60% of that's in the, in the forest itself or places like Howland. Uh, and as well as 15% in the products compared to the rest of Maine, that, that's uh, obviously a net land sink of about 79%. So the bulk of what's happening in Maine's forest, uh, our carbon budget, that happens in the forest. As you can see right here, Howland's a very special place because it's one of the few places that we can actually assess the carbon flux and validate kind of our estimates uh, at a broad scale. So this was our first stab. I know Dr. Dan Hayes of the University of Maine is working on a revised uh, carbon budget for all of Maine. Fantastic. That's a great way, I think, to tie everything together from uh, today's webinar. I see we have just a couple minutes left on the clock, so we are going into wrap-up mode. Uh, Meg put info in the chat. If you were intrigued by what you heard today and you want to come learn more in person, and if you want to climb the Flux Tower, then please register for the field tour. It's a rare opportunity, and you've heard several times Howland, uh, Howland Research Forest is a unique and special place. So please come join us uh, and take advantage of the nice weather that we will have on Friday. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, there were uh, SAF CEUs assigned, I believe, one uh, credit for, assigned for today's webinar, um, and we're really looking forward to have folks join us. Um, if people still have questions, you're, um, then uh, you're welcome to drop them into the chat. Jake's asking, how hard will the walking be? Um, not terribly difficult once we're there. We're going to be we're going to be in two central sites. There will be a 10 minute walk from one location to another. And Jake, you don't have to climb the tower, but um, you're always welcome to. Um, any other um, other questions? Oh, and Aaron reminds us that the next webinar and field tour are coming up in December. So webinar Wednesday, December 14th, um, at the, and then uh, Friday field tour at the Massabesi Experimental Forest in Alfred, Maine. So we're trying to cover the state here. Uh, thanks so much to our speakers, John, to Dave, uh, Kathleen, and to Sean, and Aaron for jumping in um, and for sharing all this knowledge that you have. Um, it was just a little taste in this short hour, but we're really excited to see you on Friday, and uh, thanks so much for your great work.